All right. So yeah, last week I said that I had covered everything that NFPA 72 had to say about duct smoke detectors. That wasn't completely true. I forgot about chapter 21, which is uh, emergency control interface. And so that's where we talk about uh, the code talks about fire alarms interfacing with elevator recall, with uh, electronically locked doors. And there's also a little bit in there about duct smoke detectors. So this week, I'm kind of correcting my statement from last week is going to finish talking about the NFPA 72 and duct detectors. Then, of course, there's also the annex in the back where it explains all this stuff we've talked about. So first, looking at chapter 21, the 21.1 and 21.2 cover some general things about emergency control function interfaces. So I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of that before we talk about the duct detectors. This is still going to be a short one, even talking about this extra stuff. Uh, first, the very first thing in the chapter is the application. The provisions of chapter 21 shall cover the minimum requirements and methods for emergency control function interfaces to fire alarm systems and emergency communication systems in accordance with this chapter. So that's just saying this chapter is going to give us all the guidelines for how to tie things to a fire alarm system. The emergency communication system is fire alarm system plus voice, and it can watch for some other things like you can have tornado warnings that are integrated into that. Uh, if we look over at the diagram on the right, we can see kind of a picture, a pictograph, I think is what they're called in the smart world that's not construction. That uh how the, the fire alarm is going to talk to all these other things. So we can see we have the fire alarm in the, the center. And if you go down to the six o'clock position, there's an emergency communication system. And it says typical two-way physical system connection. That's because if your building has an ECS system, it's most likely part of the fire alarm. They're going to talk directly to each other. And it'll be a fire alarm that can also do ECS functions. Uh, over on the right-hand side, you see the smoke or HVAC control. That's kind of a two-way communication. It's not nearly as integrated as the ECS typically is, but we do get the supervisory signal from the duct, and we tell that system to shut down on most occasions. There are some times with the conventional detectors, we're only supervising for a signal, and so we're not actually sending them any signals, but most of the time, it's going to be two-way. We're sending them a shutdown signal after we receive an alarm sig or a supervisory signal from them. Uh, up at the top, we have the elevator, fire doors, dampers, those kind of things. There's not any kind of signal for them to send back to us. We're just telling them what to do. Uh, other monitored systems, this could be like a kitchen hood or something else in the building that we just need to know the status of. So that's just an input to us. Same with sprinkler systems. Sprinkler systems are just an input to us. And then that last one down there is the supervising station alarm. That's the, the central station that we send all the stuff out over uh, the phone lines or the cellular or even IP. We can do it over the internet. That's also another way. We don't do it as much that way, but that is one that's available to us. So you can see that's a one-way communication where we just send stuff out because the central station doesn't send us a signal back saying, hey, panel, go into alarm. They just receive the alarm signals from us and then report it to the customer. The methods of interconnection between the emergency control function interface device and the component controlling the emergency control function shall be achieved by one of the following recognized means. There can be electrical contacts listed for the connected load. So that would be like a control relay, like we use for dampers, we use for elevator recall, air handler shutdown. Uh, the other one is data communication over a signaling line circuit dedicated to the fire alarm or shared with other premises operating system. So that's gonna be like how we communicate with the uh, emergency the ECS system. Uh, and then other listed methods, most of these are going to be covered by one or two. I'm not actually even sure. I can't think of an example of what an other listed method would be right now. So I'm going to keep moving on. Can I ask a question? What's up? Hey, um, so like sending an override signal to shut off speakers or something, would that be an example of that? Of that? Or is that something completely different? Are you talking about the, like how we connect to it, the one, two, or three there? Well, just like how we send a signal to shut down or override intercom speakers and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, like where they'll shut down so our stuff plays. That's an example of that one way, correct? Yeah, yeah, that would definitely be a one way. That would be uh, that electrical contact contacts. They uh, we just we close or open a switch that act that the uh, intercom is then looking at for an input. And uh, whenever we close or open that switch, they turn their signal off regardless of what's going on because the, the fire alarm always has to override whatever other message is being played. 
But yeah, that's exactly the kind of stuff that we're we're talking about in here. Any way that chapter 21 covers any way that the fire alarm connects to any other system in the building. So there's a few uh, few performance points here. I'm going to try to roll through these quickly. Uh, the performance of automatic emergency control functions shall not interfere with the power or lighting with the power for lighting or for operating elevators. Uh, quick explanation for the four operating elevators. If you go back to the annex, there's a uh, an explanation on this that says under normal conditions. So like when there's not a fire, when there's not an emergency in the building, we don't want to interfere with the normal operation of elevators. The building needs that to get people where it needs to go. There is a specific part of this chapter that deals and it's actually the majority of this chapter that deals with the operation of elevators. We've done a previous video on it before. So if you have other questions, go check it out on YouTube. The performance of automatic emergency control functions shall not preclude the combination of fire alarm services with other services requiring monitoring operation. Preclude means it can't inhibit or stop it. The emergency control functions can't stop the fire alarm from doing what it needs to do. Emergency control function interface devices shall be located within three feet of the component controlling the emergency control function. So in an elevator machine room, your relay shutting down the elevator needs to be within three feet of the controller. For uh, air handler units, if there's like a VFD in a mechanical room and we put the duct up, the duct detector up on the duct work, we need to remote mount that relay over within three feet of that VFD controller. Uh, the emergency control function interface device shall function within the voltage and current limitations of the fire alarm control unit. If there's you know, a damper circuit or something that is too high for us to, to tie into, it has to be stepped down to a way that we can still control those dampers if needed. Emergency- I got a, I got a question. Okay. What happened if your shunt trip is in a different place as far as your location of your relays for the elevator? Uh, then that shunt trip relay needs to go get moved within three feet of what it's controlling. So that would be to the shunt trip controller itself, or would that be... Yeah, so if you have your primary alternate and cab hat over beside your elevator controller, then your shunt trip relay needs to be within three feet of the actual shunt trip like the arm that throws in the room to cut the power. All right. And then uh, the last one is uh, emergency control function shall not interfere with other operations of the fire alarm system. I think that's fairly simple to understand. You know, this is an emergency life safety system. If they're actually using the fire alarm in its intended purpose, that means the building's on fire, things are going bad, something's going on. So you don't want anything to interfere with that. You, you want it to save as many lives as possible. So now getting more into what we were talking about, this is the rest of what the NFPA 72 has to say about duct detectors specifically. Uh, the first point there is just saying 21.7 tells us how to tie into HVAC systems. 21.74, smoke detectors mounted in the air ducts of HVAC systems shall initiate a supervisory signal. So this is, I, I want to cover these three points here, the 2174, 21741, and 21742. This actually recently came up in the last week where we had a competitor of ours telling a customer that we did something wrong because they're only getting supervisory signals off of our duct detectors. But because we have this code reference, we were able to actually send that over to the property management and be like, no, we're doing it right. And it gives us a leg to stand on. So here's a great example of we're knowing just a little bit of code, being familiar with it saved our butt. So the next two points after this one saying supervisory is the two allowances for where they will, where they can initiate an alarm. So the first one is smoke detectors mounted in the air ducts of HVAC, HVAC system in a fire alarm system without a constantly attended location or supervising station shall be permitted to initiate an alarm signal. So that's saying if you don't have someone 24 seven, that's by an enunciator or by the fire panel, or if it's not monitored by a central station, then it can initiate an alarm signal. Other than those, it still needs to initiate a supervisory. So the building that was in question is monitored by a uh, central station over the phone line. So it still, supervisory is still the right way to go. The last one here, smoke detectors mounted in the air ducts of HVAC system shall be permitted to initiate an alarm signal where required by other governing laws, codes, or standards. So the local fire marshal for that building had not issued any kind of thing requiring that the, uh, the duct detector initiate an alarm. We do have some that do that, like the city of Pearland, for instance. They want all of them to be alarm signals. So it is code compliant in Pearland to make, make it be an alarm. But in city of Houston, 
it's fine to make it be a supervisory. So I just wanted to include that in there. Hopefully, if you've ever had any confusion on should it be an alarm, should it be a supervisory and why, this cleared it up. And then our last thing to cover, firefighter smoke control station. You can see a picture of that here on the right. I'll read the couple codes real quick. Where in interconnected as a combination system, a firefighter smoke control station shall be provided to perform manual control over the automatic operation of the system smoke control strategy. Where interconnected as a combination system, the smoke control system programming shall be designed such that normal HVAC operation or changes do not prevent the intended performance of the smoke control strategy. So all this is saying is that in some buildings, there are these smoke control panels. Uh, when we tie them into a fire alarm system, everything still needs to be able to, whenever they're on the auto mode, everything still needs to be able to work like it normally would. And then the smoke control just activates auxiliary control over it. So if the firefighters are in the building and they're going up and down and they're like, hey, override and command this fan on, it can do that or override and turn this fan off. It can do that. Or they can put it back in auto mode and everything will function as normal. There's not a ton of buildings that we've had to do this in. I believe Shenandoah has made us do it in one building. And so that's a, a small jurisdiction up in the Woodlands area. And then other than that, the ones I've ran across have been voluntary systems they put in for insurance purposes. So that's all I have today. That finishes up. Hi. What's up, Ramsey? <laughs> hey, so looking at that, the last slide that you just showed, is it does do it hook up the same way or is there a specific way that you have to uh, interconnect that for a smoke control panel yeah uh typically there will be two relays there's one that's a shut off relay and then there will be one that's a command on relay uh they'll still both be controlled by slc you'll just have two relays for that duct detector instead of one or for that air handler unit, I should say. Uh, other than that, it's still pretty much the same as far as physical install goes. 